Journey with me now back just prior to the turning of the first century to John, the experience of John the Beloved. <clears throat> Somewhere around the year, roughly 96 AD as we understand, John would have been rather old at this time. He had been about at least 60 years since he stood on the... Uh, on the Mount of Olives and saw Jesus go up into heaven. And he'd lived a rich and a fruitful life. But toward the close of his life, he wasn't allowed to, to retire in a nice, peaceful, quiet community. He was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, a rocky isle that jutted out into the Aegean Sea, sort of a morose environment. We don't know how long he was there, how much, how well, he spent his time, but there came a day when he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. <clears throat> he never did forget Jesus raising again on the first day. He never did forget Jesus appearing to him on the first day, right. two times. He didn't forget the day of Pentecost on the first day of the week when the Holy Spirit was poured out by Jesus. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So if you think you have your problems, <laughs> don't tell them to Brother John. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. We don't know how many Lord's days he's he'd been in the Spirit on that aisle. But on this one, he heard a voice. It was such a such a voice. He said, I turned to see the voice. To see the voice. I turned. Well, it, uh, it, it was Jesus, the glorified Christ. He had a message to give to John, but before he could give the message, he had to, he had to administer a little bit of correction to some of the churches and... Uh, and some exhortations to them, and they give them a few commendations to kind of tune them up so they could receive what he had to say. And uh, after he delivered these of the fourth chapter, then and not until he delivered these messages, there was a, there was a door opened up in heaven. Now, we had, uh, we'd read in Scripture about the windows of heaven, Malachi being opened up, but this is a, it wasn't a window, it's a door. Right. And I gather doors in heaven are rather large and imposing <laughs> doors. And he looked, of course, he saw a throne, him sitting on it. And, and um, to get briefly to my point here, he, the one sitting on the throne had a book, right. scroll. The road, the word book a good word. It indicates what's written. The word scroll indicates what's written, what it's written on. So they're both of them, I'd say that because <laughs> people get kind of lost in the image. But a book has to do with what's in it and the scroll has to do with the material that it's written on. So he saw he had this scroll. It was sealed with seven seals. As you know, it, it it was a book of eternal destiny, like the book of God's intention, what God was going to do, but nobody knew what it was. Uh -huh. But however, uh, this is of great concern to people that are close to God, to, to know that God determined something and then not to know it. This is, this is a red disconcerting. Yeah. So a, a word went out, if anyone was found it worthy, <laughs> you couldn't like open this by brute force. You yeah. You couldn't do that, and, and it, there wasn't anyone who could just, like, command it and it just fall open. It wasn't that way. Someone had to be qualified to open this, and the word came back that uh, we're looking in heaven now, keep in mind. We're not looking on earth. Uh -huh. We're looking in heaven, and the word come back. Nobody could be found that was worthy. Oh, John, uh, he's getting close now to the time he's going to disembark. He said, I wept much. Oh, I wanted to know what was in that book. So one of the more informed uh, personalities standing by him said, don't want to weep. <laughs> we, we found someone that can open it. 
is someone that he would qualify down where you are. He qualified himself down there. Mm -hmm. He's it's a lamb. And then commence this dialogue about the... Well, during this dialogue, <clears throat> John saw there's a lot of activity. As soon as the lamb comes into the picture, there's a lot of activity up there in the heavenly places. The... Uh, the elders that stood around, they, they, they praised him. They praised him for, we don't know who these elders are, but there's some exalted personalities. Then there's some four living creatures, like cherubim, seraphim type creatures, very close to the throne, they were there. And these 24 elders and the four beasts, they fell down. Hey, they didn't never have fallen down before any mortal. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, these, these heavenly personalities never have fallen down before even another angel. Right. They fell, this is a man, a glorified man we're talking about, that fell down before him. Yeah. And they all had, uh, they all had golden vials and harps. In these vials, there were odors or fragrances, perfumes, we would, we would call it. It harkens back to like the incense of the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a very fragrant odors, and they said that they were the prayers of the saints <clears throat> handled by these heavenly beings, which indicates they kind of have a role in like carrying them out. Yeah. And then, it, then this, this, this word is given right after he mentions these prayers or the prayers of the saints, and they sung a new song, mm -hmm. saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us kings and priests unto God, our God, has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So what are these 24 elders doing saying something like that? Don't forget, they were holding the prayers of the saints. I gather that, that has, that's related there somehow. That these prayers of the saints are reflected in these, this statement that these 24 elders made. Now I want to look at it just very briefly. Thou hast redeemed us. The Lamb did this. Thou hast redeemed us. You bought us. Thou hast redeemed us, you delivered us. Mm -hmm. Thou hast redeemed us. Now Israel was redeemed out of Egypt. Uh -huh. Thou hast redeemed us to God. Mm -hmm. yeah. In other words, we're done living for ourselves. Uh -huh. That's over. We've seen it now. We did a miserable job living for ourselves. In fact, we had to be saved from that life. Right. So how foolish is it to live for self? See, How foolish is it if you had to be delivered from that kind of life, you had to be saved from that kind of life, you had to be washed from that kind of life, God had to do something about it, or you'd have just died and gone to hell. Mm -hmm. God's redeemed us unto God not unto Moses, that had been good. He was a holy man. Hmm? Not unto David, he was a good man. He was a, not unto them. Right. Not to John the Baptist, he was a good man. Unto God. And we've come from all over the place. Mm -hmm. Every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation. Sin was like a sea. It was like Noah's flood. Yeah. Think of sin like Noah's flood. It covered the face of the whole earth. And from every, as far, wherever sin covered, somebody came out of that morass of sin and was redeemed to God. Amen. From every place, every place sin had infected, you, you brought us out of this. From, from every kindred, every, every groups of people, they're related by blood. Every tongue every kind of language people speak in the earth, every kind of people, like ethnic bodies of people, 
and, and nations, kind of political environment. <laughs> Think of the different kind of political environments that people been saved from. Germany during Hitler's day. <laughs> huh? Iraq during Saddam Hussein's day. Hmm? And other, other countries. Ghana during Idi Amin's day. I mean, there's, just think all the group, all the people groups been redeemed to God. And that's not all he did. He made us kings and priests to God. So that what God's, God works through these people now. See, kings and priests aren't people that let's like sit and uh, have the people come to them and they don't do anything. They, they're, these are functioning roles. Kings and priests. Made us kings and priests to God. And before this thing is over, these, remember, these prayers of the saints are going up, produce this. We're going to reign in the earth. Of course, that's what Jesus said. The meek shall inherit the earth. That's what it says. Amen. Now, brother, when we come around this table here, it's good for us to remember that we've been delivered from sin, delivered from the power of darkness, washed from our sins. It's good to remember that. But you don't want to forget where we've come. Yeah. We've been redeemed to God. Now, I tell you, you can live under God fairly effectively because he delivered you from your sin. For a while, you can live like that. Not for long. If you're going to live effectively for God, you got to have this hope Brother Aaron talked about. Believe me when I tell you this, you, I come from a, I don't even want to talk about the background I came from. Is that bad? That bad. I probably am the worst among you, if you talk about my background. But I could not sustain life, spiritual life, by recalling what I came out of. Why, Israel forgot it before, Israel forgot it before a couple of months was over, they forgot it. But now you talk about kings and priests unto God. Now there, that's a, why can't you forget that? Because it's not over yet. You're not there yet. It's being held out to you. And when Paul talked about this table, he said, we do this, we proclaim his death <laughs> till he come. Amen. See? That's the unto God, yeah. unto God part. So this... Uh, this I exhort you to do is in a time like this, see how well you can master your mind, see what kind of kind of discipline you have over your mind, spiritual discipline. See how you can focus your mind on where you're going because that's the only reason he brought you out was to take you someplace. He didn't take you out just because that's a bad place you need to get out of there. That was a bad place. We needed to get out of there. But see, there's... There's another place. You gotta live someplace, brethren. You gotta live. You gotta live someplace. And if where you were living is not suitable, what I want to know is that where are we going to live? If he took us out of the where we were, where are we going? Yep. Kings and priests to God. It start. The kinghood and priesthood starts now, Amen. with some preliminary assignments. They're they're nothing to be compared to what what we're going to have, but. He'll like give you your own life. He'll say, take, here's your first assignment. Master your own life. Culture the, culture the things I put in there. Subdue the things that you've been delivered from. And then I may give you some other assignments. Maybe you'll be able to save somebody. Huh? Said the wives, you know, said they'd be able to save their husbands. Well, how do you know, he says to an unbelieving to a wife or a husband has an unbelieving spouse, spouse. How do you know? You may save your husband or save your wife. That's what he said in 1 Corinthians 7. Right. And Paul said, I become all things to all men that I might save some. See? Of course, that's phase two. Mm -hmm. Phase one is you've got to save yourselves from this untoward generation. Yeah. Yeah. When you do, you come. And you, you may give you a task of feed my sheep. 
But you do it as a king and a priest. See, all that can be remembered at this, at this table. So let's join uh, Brother John, kind of fix in our mind what he saw and, and join him in fellowship because he said, I'm your companion in tribulation and in the kingdom of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our dear Heavenly Father, we